super excited. Look at this. Dart frogs, dart frogs, dart frogs, dart frogs. It was funny. I actually, when I first we first set that up, it was um, I got asked to do a talk at Purdue University at this like veterinary graduation. You would. Day. And um, they told me to give a if I could give a humorous discussion about like exotic frog veterinary care. So I wrote about how veterinarians played a role at Josh's frogs. And we called it "How Do We Get Frogs to Have Sex in Glass Boxes." Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lots of cool stuff, but this is probably the most comical. They got a. They got this really cool, nice sticker map of the United States. However, they didn't have the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and they added Hawaii. <laughs> over there. You gotta love a business that not only does some amazing things in amphibians and reptiles and arachnids, I mean, insects, you name it, but to have an atmosphere that has morale and fun, that's why they're successful. So look, Josh's Frogs isn't necessarily open to the public, but you can go to their website, right? Josh'sFrogs.com, and they have an amazing social media platform. They've got an awesome YouTube channel. But what you don't usually see is how they do things from within. And I'm not talking about what they're selling and how much is going out. That's irrelevant because it's how they're doing it, how they orchestrate a fantastic team with super, super talented people and just raising breeding and even sometimes not even selling some amazing species just for the prolification so that we're not removing it from the wild that's josh's frogs and right now we're in the wild room so we're about to get freaky too freaky for your audience <laughs> um hope these frogs can get freaky though so this is our wild caught tinctorious room um all the dart frogs in here are wild caught um i'll say i'm not a fan of working with wild caught animals i'd much rather them stay in the wild but with a lot of these species, even the most common ones, um, there's just not the genetic variability available in the hobby to keep producing healthy animals for generations to come. So a couple years ago, we worked with some importers. We brought in, you know, five to 10 pairs of some of the more common varieties of Tinctorius out there, and then worked to establish these new bloodlines in. So each of these animals is a founder animal. It's incredibly important. And um, we keep these wild pots. We're using these to produce F1s to make sure that the dart frogs that we're producing are healthy and genetically variable. We're not breeding sister to brother or parent to child or anything like that. Um, by doing so, a lot of these animals, we're good for the next 50 to 100 years without any kind of input from the wild. And that's really what we want to be. Um, wild cut animals are going to need to come in for the pet trade, but they can come in in very small amounts. They can come in and receive excellent veterinary care in a situation like this and be used and acclimated to produce a lot of babies. This room produced about 4,000 babies last year. Um, you could see, you know, from a handful of frogs, relatively, that came in from the wild, they'll do so for another 10 years, and we have enough genetic variability to do that for the next several decades. So that's really kind of the, what the independence of the pet trade looks like. Um, I think we can be a lot more humane about managing what we have um, and using those resources a lot more carefully so the animals in the wild more or less can stay in the wild, and then we can still enjoy some really healthy, vibrant, um, exotic pet animals that we know and love. So check this out. Toads need love too. What is, we were just in a wild dart frog room, but I'm, these are albino yeah, fire belly? Those are albino, um, they're bumpina variegata. So they're, what did you just say? They're bumpina variegata. So they're European fire bellies or yellow belly toads. Um, another variety we're working with, and um, we brought some over from Europe to kind of help establish in the hobby. Um, right now, all those fire bellies you see in pet stores, almost all of them are wild caught. So we're captive breeding those here, and then we're also working with different species and different morphs that we think um, might be a little bit more desirable. Customers might like them a little bit more to try to compete directly with those wild caught imports too. Well, sweet. So they go from breeding in these, you know, 15, I see 20, I see some tall exoterra. You're breeding, and then they go yep. here? Well, they breed, and then they go into our next room, which is actually the tadpole room normally. Ooh. So, yeah. so we, we jumped a step. Yeah, so we jumped a step. So we do those, and then generally, depending on the species, they'll end up, we'll raise the offspring out in an area. A fan of organizing stuff, like a kitchen, where there's like a flow, so you don't have to worry about contamination. Um, the thing is, because of space limitations, we've kind of had to backtrack on some of that. Um, so where my biosecurity is right now versus where I want it to be isn't exactly on, on par. But at least with a new facility and stuff, we're going to be able to build something inside from the ground up. Tadpoles! <laughs> this is our tadpole room. So all of our tree frog and toad tadpoles can be raised communally. So like these lemur tree frogs or smooth-sided toads, red-eyed tree frogs, they're in big groups over here. 
And then our dart frog tadpoles are on the other side. This is actually the low part of the year. And they're actually cannibalistic. So we raise them individually. So in each gray bin, there's a dozen cups with a dozen little tadpoles. And they're raised out that way. So it's pretty crazy. No, this is, uh, I don't know. This is really hard to, to catch on scale for anything, but everybody always has this predetermined thought of how things are supposed to be done. When did Josh's frog start? Um, it started in uh, the, the early 2000s, so we officially incorporated in 2004. So 2004, officially incorporated, right? This is a work in progress all the time, but there's one, one thing that has always stayed true, and that was the best possible care to get the best possible data so that you knew exactly what was happening with that animal so that you can continue to have a solid, healthy species for years to come. And I'm not just talking five, 10 years from now. Josh's Frog's plan sounds like 100 years. Yeah, 100, 100, 100, we, we, um, whenever we bring a project on, I will not work with it until, unless I can keep it viable for at least two decades. And um, after we've established it, we make sure there's a market for those animals and that there's something that should be kept as a pet. Um, you know, they meet the requirements as far as ease of care. Um, we push it out to at least 50 years. So we want to be we want to be around for a long time. Um, we love what we do. We wouldn't be doing anything else, and we're working to do, get better at it every day. And for those that are so so invested on keeping their even breeding aquariums. So if you're watching this and you're like, oh, I don't like frogs, man, but you you love fish. If you go back to some earlier videos, green water is fantastic for breeding. It is just absolutely perfect conditions for breeding and clearly for breeding frogs and raising tadpoles. I want to see this right here. You see how that leaf is folded over? These are Phylomedusa um, hypochondrialis, or a tiger-like tree frog. And so when the male and the female are on plexus, when he's getting a piggyback right on her back before she lays eggs and be fertilized, they actually grab this branch and they actually lay the eggs down the middle and glue it shut as a way to protect the eggs from drying out. Then when the tadpoles hatch, they release this, the, the kind of fluid in the eggs, will dissolve some of that gel and it'll open up and it'll drop down in the water. So they're pretty cool. Wait a minute. The dude gives the female a piggyback ride? No, no, no. The, he gets the piggyback ride. She's doing all the work. Ladies, you know. take note. <laughs> piggyback rides for all the dudes how awesome is that they use their own evolved substance to keep the leaf closed to protect their young you're you're missing out on some of the most fascinating things in this world because you're too busy looking at fish check out some frogs we can raise them up to adulthood in this and never like change our substrate and stuff and they're still just as clean as if we were changing them and stressing them out all the time it's like here we go these are um these guys are just little mantellus, just the brown ones. And so, these are all captive bred. Um, you know, and we're, we're happy because every time we sell one of these, we, give, we send, um, we tally it up at the end of the year, and then we either send supplies or a check over to Operation Misinju in Madagascar. They're based off of Indasa. Misinju? Misinju. Oh, yeah. okay. If you go onto our website, you can find them. Um, you can search for it, and it'll pop up under the blogs. But that was our first, like, conservation. Bye. Yeah. Bye. If you're interested in frogs, it's perfect because they're donating back to the natural habitat. It doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, we're firm believers in um, conservation through commercialization. If we can do a good enough job producing it here, there's no need for it to come from out there, and then it could stay put, and we can have these animals preserved in the wild, and we can enjoy them in our hobby. Um, that's indirect conservation. We're also trying to pair everything we do with direct conservation. So, like, this is the, this is the first year we launched what we call our, our amphibian conservation grants. Dart Frogs did well enough last year that we're donating $2,500 to sponsor um, cons actual conservation projects or research that directly helps in situ conservation of amphibians around the world. So you can go on the website and actually take, put applications in right now through the end of April. And then um, by um, early June, we'll select people. It's three $500 grants and then one $1,000 grant. And that one winner will also be paying to have them present their project and their material at a um, a reptile and amphibian educational conference too and pay all their travel expenses. That's awesome. So, yeah, it's really cool. It's a good chance to kind of, the success we see here, get that directly linked to success out there. And that's really what we want to do at the end of the day. Everywhere you turn, it's a ribbit, oh, ribbit, ribbit. He's actually, this is a, our big female Malaysian leaf frog, but she's actually at an outreach today at MSU. Huh? Look at that. So, yeah. She's at an outreach program. Yeah. If you like yellow ones, if you like blue ones, green ones, you name it. You want some really cool super blue erratus. You want 
Dendrobate, Tinctorious, Yellowback, you want Patricia, you want Vanessa, you, I mean, maybe we can create one that's named LaFonda. We don't know. We're not there yet. But what I know is Josh's Frogs does some really cool stuff with, I mean, some dart frogs that I've, I've never seen in person. I've never seen at a zoo. I've never seen at a reptile show. None of it. And they're all here. How many... How many species of dart frog do you have? Um, if here? we look at, consider morphs, so different populations in a while. I'll like, pray. I was just corrected. Um, we're looking at about 130. 130. How many, do you know roughly how many there are? Total? Yeah. Um, it's, it has to be in the probably three to four hundreds. So quite 120 a 120 is not um, too shabby. Most dart frogs are actually fairly um, cryptic in color. They want to blend in. They don't want to stand out. So there's a lot of animals that are browns and blacks and stuff like that, which there does, there's not a lot of demand for. So we tend to work with the more colorful varieties and the and ones that are better to like kind of start out with. So Tinctorius, Lucamellus. Yeah, and that and that totally makes sense. I mean, I'm looking here. Like the old system, we have lovely notes. <laughs> you know, um, right? What? How many are in there? What they are? Um, notes to the other keepers. You know, as a hobbyist, you're working with you know a big hobbyist might work with 30 or 40 tanks. I know those animals well. Here we have hundreds of tanks, and then we have. Um, you know a set number of employees so we're always trying to figure out how to get communication better so all the newer tags they actually have what's called an nfc chip it's a little chip where you'll be able to hold an android device up to and it's a little or apple chip. um apple uses it with apple pay so we can't get the reader to work so far so. <laughs> sorry, sorry apple, folks sorry we're all google we're mostly google phone people here for, <laughs> for, tech for this so every employee here has a um a, a nexus tablet that we use for task management and everything but they can scan the the data and it'll pop up with a Google form that'll allow them to um, put in, like if they witness an animal skinny or if they pulled eggs, how many eggs are there. So we pull all of that data. Anything urgent is automatically alerted via email. The, the manager is aware of it so they can check in on it if that animal needs urgent care or anything. NFC technology inside a dart frog room with 120 species monitoring all of the things. When I say all of the things, I mean all of the things. I'm talking feeding schedule, the way they look, how many, just eggs that were dropped. Think about this successful and paying attention to the detail and that's one of the key things when you're raising breeding and ultimately sustaining and then selling amazing creatures you have to pay attention to the details and you'll notice somebody may go well those tanks look pretty dirty well guess what the darts actually prefer it because it makes them feel more comfortable they're they're shielded in a sense it's like a curtain a natural curtain to make them feel more comfortable so they can do their ditty. What he just told me, and it started with, you know it's also pretty crazy, is they temperature and monitor humidity electronically and they'll get alerts if something should go awry. They're not messing around here at Josh's Frogs. So I'm not, I'm not saying that, man, they're doing the, you know, they're the best at what they do, but they are driving to be the best at what they do. And they're constantly making new additions, they're expanding, they're growing a knowledge base, and they're bringing on key people for key roles to make sure that their mission and their focus is continued. The US from Europe or whatnot by a, a gentleman named Adam Butt. So those are actually all butt line attention. Look at that. Look, she did her makeup for us today. I mean, look at the orange that sits right on the, the eye ridge and the nose. I'm telling you, you haven't seen animals. And if you're watching this for the first time, know that once they are out of the wild, they no longer have access to that food source and they're no longer poisonous. How awesome is that? Look at this. He's those ready are, to boogie down. Yeah, those are Patricia. That's a variety of Tinctorius that was exported from Suriname to the U.S. in the late 90s. And the exporter actually named it after the lady in Texas who received them, Patricia Gruenberg. Oh, really? So, yeah, they're pretty frogs. Uh, really, really bright blue legs. Yeah, really they're popular. This is, I mean, every time you turn around, this is, I actually asked. You ain't getting one, folks, but. Woohoo! Thanks for coming along on the behind the scenes tour of Josh's Frogs. Visit joshesfrogs.com. You know what's next. Ah!